Imagine if each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing you are happy even while you're dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcast inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. I'm Emily Zerothret, welcoming you to explore with me your life of endless possibilities. Aloha. Welcome to our podcast today. I am so excited to have Colin Campbell here as our special guest. He's written an incredible book and is actually in New York right now doing a one-man show having to do with grief that is pretty amazing. I got to see some clips of it. I I wish I could go watch the whole thing. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome, Colin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, could, could you tell us a little bit about you? You, you are an amazing person. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm a, I write and direct for theater and occasionally for film. And I also teach. I teach screenwriting at Chapman University and I teach theater directing at Cal Poly Pomona University. And I'm currently doing a solo show at, in New York City all about grief, as you mentioned. And, uh, and I'm, I'm married to my wife. Gail Lerner, and and we had two uh, beautiful children who were killed by a drunk driver. So Ruby was 17 years old and Hart was 14 years old when we were hit by a drunk driver. Wow, that's it's so uh, incredible to experience something like that. And you have taken your experience and and done some really good things with it. Your your show, oh, I think, is, is beautiful, and and your book. Um, I, yes. they, what you said about reading a lot of grief books when it first happened, I did that too. I've had mm-hmm. two husbands die, and and when the when the first one died, it it wasn't that common to have mm. uh, grief books. They, they, there just weren't that many of them out there. So after Ron died, my most recent husband to die, I found them and I started reading them, and and I, <laughs> I had kind of the same feelings that you described as having a uh, memoirs mm-hmm. and and it's i i am an advocate for writing i've taught writing at the university level for many years and i i really believe in in using writing to deal with grief but they don't it doesn't always make the best books and <laughs> I, I don't always, I didn't always feel like I needed to just listen to their story. And so when I write, wrote my book, I put at the end of the ch- each chapter something that the reader could do. And mm-hmm. I saw that you did, did that in your book. And I just, I love yeah. that because readers really comment on, thank you so much for mm-hmm. giving me something concrete. And in, in your book, what, your suggestions are fabulous. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's such an important part of moving through grief is to actually take action to, to do something with our grief rather than just be like passive recipients that and just feel overwhelmed by it all. It's really been eye opening to me to see how helpful it is to, to take action, almost any action in grief as a way of moving through it. Yes. I, I totally agree with you on that. There's so much I like about your book Oh, thank you. Um, your your writing style is is just beautiful. I really highly recommend this book. And you talk about things that I haven't been reading in other books. Oh. So, and I, I liked, uh, okay. for instance, I, I liked about sitting. Do you say sh- Shiva or Shiva? Shiva. 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 That's, yeah. that's what I thought it was. Was Shiva. I I actually did that once. My daughter in law's father just died suddenly. And mm-hmm. they, their whole whole family was was very Jewish, and it was so beautiful. It yeah. was such a, a wonderful thing to do. Yeah, well, so eye opening for me because I, I'm not Jewish, but my wife is Jewish, and we raised our kids as Jews, and and we're active members of our temple, and so I really leaned into the Jewish traditions. I trusted in them to help me through through the mourning process, and I learned so much. So so much of my book is is really expounding all the lessons I learned from the Jewish traditions. And, and as you mentioned, Shiva is such a beautiful idea that's kind of runs contrary to what I, what I thought of, you know, I thought of like something terrible happens and you're grieving and you go away to be by yourself in your pain. And in fact, it's, that's, a, that's a really rough road 
to go all by yourself. It's so much more helpful to be surrounded by your community. And that's what sitting Shiva is. It's, it's basically for a whole week after the funeral, people come to your house every day and they just sit with you and, and they're, they're supposed to reflect where you're at. So if you want to be telling beautiful, happy stories of the person you lost, then the crowd is supposed to respond in kind. If you want to just weep, they're supposed to just let you weep or join you in weeping. If you want to be silent, then it's quiet. Like it's a really beautiful and supportive idea. It, it really is lovely. I, I love the idea of community with grief, because as you mm. said, uh, a lot of people assume that when you grieve, it's something that you go off and do by yourself and don't bother other people with. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think a real misconception starts right away because in, in very fresh grief, I think a lot of us do want to be left alone because we're just overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But then people hear that and they think, oh, let's leave them alone forever, <laughs> right? <laughs> leave them alone. Um, we don't want to bother them. And then I think a lot of, a lot of us grievers, you know, a, a couple of days, a week, whatever, a month passes and we're like, wait, where is everybody? <laughs> Why are these people all leaving us behind? And, uh, and part of the impetus for writing my book was, was finding ways to articulate our needs to our community to, so that they are able to be with us, that they don't just run away and stay away. Um, I think it's, it's hard, but necessary for people in grief to do the outreach, to get the community, to teach the community what, what our needs are, because it is individualistic, right? What each person needs in grief is, is different um, moment to moment, and it changes day to day, even hour to hour, what we need. And so finding a way to express those needs to our community, I believe, leads us to not being so alone in our grief, which is so, so wonderful to, to be able to mourn in community. That's right. That, that if people take nothing else away today, <laughs> except for that, to mm -hmm. recognize the importance of community in, in grief, and it can be anticipatory grief also. Both of yeah. my husbands ironically died from the same thing when I married the, oh. the second one. He didn't <laughs> didn't have those problems, so I didn't know that that was going to happen. Right. But both of them were were um, very ill and dealing with lots of medical problems for the last two years of their wow. lives. And we found that when they first got diagnosed, that people were there all over the place. You know, they come to the hospital and they bring flowers, they bring food, they call and check, they do all these things. And the longer they were sick, the further away the people got. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. I expressed what I needed to express and now I'm on to my own life, you know? And uh -huh. it, it, it got very lonely, especially that last year before they died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think loneliness is talked about so much when people are grieving. And I, I think really in order for us to move through our grief, part of the part of how we process humans process anything is by talking about it with our friends. Like we see a movie that we love, we talk about it with our friends and family, right? We, something big momentous happens in our life. We want to share it. And I believe that's how we literally process it and understand our new realities. And grief is such a traumatic event, can be such a traumatic event. So there is that need to, to process it. And, and how do we talk about it to other people if they're all running away? Yes, that's that's true. I was I was thinking about how uh, I have this organization now. When when I wrote my book and I started doing things, I wanted to do more because you know the bo book was written and I wanted to do more. And I kept thinking mm. something was missing, and I realized that happiness was what was missing because we, when we talk about grief, we don't talk about being happy and and feeling good and being able to. Yeah take a breath and and be able to move forward at whatever small steps that we take. And so I started doing a lot of work on that. And this this podcast, obviously, is Grief and Happiness. And <laughs> uh, Marcy Shimoff wrote a book called Happy for No Reason. She was one of the people in the movie The Secret. And uh -huh. I had read that book after Jacques died. And when after Ron died, I ran across it again. And I thought that this is this is what... I need to incorporate into the work that I'm doing with grief. Yeah. So I, with a, a bunch of people that, that I know, different friends throughout the country and world, actually, uh, we formed the Grief and Happiness Alliance. And we yeah. meet on Zoom every week. And we write about things uh, that have to do with, with grief and love 
and dealing with your life then and then learning happiness practice every week. And the really positive thing about this is a sense of community that we build, Mm. that you have somebody to talk to that's not going to judge you, somebody else that's experiencing grief and understands the concept of grief. And it, it's so important. So I think the work that yeah. both of us are doing with, with getting the word out there on community and supporting each other yeah. is so important. Yeah. And I think, I think, I, I, I think what you're saying is beautiful. The idea of happiness and, and really embracing it. And I think it is, it's very challenging for people in grief. You know, first we have to give permission, give mm-hmm. ourselves permission to feel that without, without the guilt, you know, or, or we feel some guilt too, and then that's okay, right? We live with the guilt, but we still embrace the happiness that we get. You know, that, that's a very, um, can be very challenging, but so important. It's mm-hmm. so important to be present in, in this life that we're in, right? We're alive. We lost someone that's so dear to us, but we're alive. And how do we, how do we allow ourselves to touch the joy of being alive without like compart- compartmentalizing grief or like, you know, we're not forgetting the person who's gone. We're trying to bring them along with us. Yeah. Yes, I think that's so important. I, I was just recalling, I'm not sure if I'm remembering this correctly from your book, but how your, was it your rabbi that sat with you and said, tell me about your children? Oh, no, that was the, that was the night of the crash. That oh, was, that was, that was the, the, okay. That was the, the PICU unit doctor, the, the pediatric that's intensive right. care unit doctor. Yeah, yeah, it was so remarkable. I, I felt like everybody was avoiding us in these hospitals. We went to two different hospitals and it felt like everybody knew that our kids were dead, but they didn't want to tell us. And even though there were, there were social workers at the, at those hospitals, but they weren't telling us the truth. They were come in and told us about, you know, Oh, there's a, there's a Ronald McDonald house you can stay at. And, and my wife and I were thinking, stay at a, what's happening. Are, are our kids dead or not? Mm-hmm. What's going on? And then this doctor, this wonderful doctor, didn't shy away. She wasn't frightened of our grief. And she sat down and she told us the truth. You know, our children had died, but they were keeping heart alive, on, you know, just so we could say goodbye to him before they essentially pulled the plug because they were, it was artificially keeping him alive and they, and they couldn't. Um, you know, he, he died of three life ending injuries. So that there, was no, there was no hope for either of them in the back seat. And, uh, and just her frankness and honesty and, and her willingness to sit with us and then invite our grief, right? Tell us, tell me about Ruby and Hart. It was so powerful. And it also gave us something to do in that moment. Instead of just wailing, we, we had an action again, something to do. And it was beautiful to talk about Ruby and Hart in that moment. Uh, but, but painful, obviously. We were weeping. <laughs> mm-hmm. We were in agony and she wasn't afraid of us. She wasn't afraid of our pain. Um, that was a very valuable lesson for me. That's, that's just so beautiful. I, I know yeah. that, that that's one of the things pe- people say, and you talk about this in your book, people say, I don't know what to say to somebody when they're grieving. And so they say something mm-hmm. stupid. So, right. <laughs> right. They're awesome. trying, to give, trying to give comfort, but there's no comfort. Let's just talk about the loss. Let's feel yeah. the pain, right? Yeah, I yeah. always tell them what, what you can't go wrong with is to say something kind about the person, their loved one. You know? Yeah, exactly. Is that, that's the that, most, that's that. the most beautiful things that we heard. You know, people just start sharing stories about Ruby and Hart and, and then sharing their pain at the loss, you know, how, how much they miss Ruby and Hart. It helped us feel not so alone in our grief, right? Because we realized, you know, it's shared. It's shared by all these people. All these people loved our children and they're all in pain. It helps. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. The, the compassionate ear and the compassionate silence sometimes you don't have to mm-hmm. as as dealing with somebody who's grieving you don't have to talk all the time to them or you don't have to <laughs> right. teach teach them something <laughs> right yeah you're not trying to distract them or fix their problem you're really there for them to talk to you yeah yes that's right and and it, it's so important what what advice would you give to someone who wanted to help someone who's grieving? Mm-hmm. What what would you yeah. suggest? Yeah, well, I think really what what you just said really is just being there for them, um, and then being there for them repeatedly. You know, keep offering specific specific offerings. Like I'm available Friday at two o'clock to go for a walk. Would you like to go for a walk with me? You know, 
Uh, I'm available for lunch on Saturday. Um, I'd love to take you out and talk because I think a lot of times people in grief, they're going to say no a lot, you know, they're going to not feel up for it in the moment. And, and, and then I think some people who love people who are grieving get the wrong idea. They think, Oh, I, I offered to go for a walk twice. And they said, no. So obviously they don't want to hear from me ever again. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then they just back way off. And I think, you know, if you're, if you really have a real relationship with this person, they, they will eventually want to go on that walk with you and they will, they will eventually want to talk about their loved one. And if you can keep being present for them, that's a beautiful thing. So important. So, so yeah. incredibly important. I, I had one friend who knew that I wouldn't go if she asked me to go on a walk and she just came over to my house one day and she goes, we're going to the beach and we're going for a walk. Oh, you know, no question, yeah. no opportunity <laughs> to deny her. <laughs> and it was so good for me to get out of the house because I just yeah. hadn't been able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's so hard to get out of the house, to make decisions in early grief. Um, and, uh, and yet, like you said, it's so helpful. It's so helpful because it's, you know, it's ultimately re-engaging with life, you know, trusting that, that, re-engaging, taking that walk with somebody, being present, it's going to, it's going to pull us along through our grief. Yeah. That's right. And I, I know um, it would, it, it pertains to this too, is the idea of I, with me, my knee jerk reaction was no to anything. <laughs> somebody said something. Yep. And when I know Shonda Rhimes came out with a, a book about the year of saying yes. Mm. And I uh, thought, oh, maybe that's what I need to do <laughs> is <laughs> instead of just automatically saying no, but open myself up to opportunities for comfort or friendship or a cup of coffee, whatever it is, <laughs> to, yeah. to just say yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I had that exact same experience. I, I, I felt like I was going to say no to everybody. And I also couldn't make a decision. So I decided I would say yes to everybody. I did that exact same thing. I made it my policy. If anybody suggested something, I would just say yes to it. Even if I really didn't want it, even if it was like a really bad idea, I thought I just said yes to all of it. And, uh, and I actually stayed very active in early grief. Almost every day I had some activity with some person, usually a different person each day. And, uh, some of them are, you know, semi disasters, but some <laughs> of them are wonderful, <laughs> but it was so helpful to just decide I'm going to say yes to everything. Cause it's so hard to make a decision, you know, do I really want to? No, I don't, but yes, do it. Yeah. <laughs> do it. Just, you oh, just kind of got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so important. I, I know after, um, after Jacques died and I'd been sitting at home alone for a year, I go to work and I'd come home mm. and sit and didn't do much of anything. Cause I just, I couldn't decide what to do. It just was right. beyond the way my brain was working at that time. Mm -hmm. And when New Year's came, I thought, I'm going to make a resolution or I'm going to make resolutions. And I thought, well, how's that worked in the past? And <laughs> of course it hadn't. Uh, for a week or two, it was good. But <laughs> I decided right. this time I was going to do something and I was going to commit to it. So I thought, okay, what is one thing that I can focus on? And what came to me was I was going to say yes to invitations. Mm. And what was strange about that was this was almost a year after he died and I wasn't getting any invitations <laughs> for anything. <laughs> right. You know, as you said, people will ask once or twice and then they don't ask anymore. And so mm. I thought, I, I don't know why, but this feeling is so strong that I'm supposed to accept invitations that I decided that was my resolution, my intention for that year. And oh. boy, did the invitations start coming. I had invitations to all oh. kinds of things I never would have thought of to do before. Wow. And it was a wonderful experience. And it, it, that was truly what allowed me to see I can move forward in this. No, mm -hmm. nobody's asking me to forget Jacques or, you know, pretend like I wasn't married or something. Mm -hmm. But this this gave me something to to focus on in a way that I could do something positive. I could be involved in the community. And it made a huge difference for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think ultimately all of us have to 
find ways to reconnect to meaning and purpose. Why are we here on earth? Why are we, what are we doing with our lives? And, and I think the only way to do that is to connect outside ourselves to somebody else or something else, some creature, animal, plant, creature out there that we can, we can connect to and in some level be of service to or, yeah, connect to other people out in the world. That's, it has certainly led me to do things that I never would have thought about doing on my own, you know, mm. <laughs> all this, this grief work and books and alliance and podcast. And I, that, right. that wasn't in, in my future that I could see, you know, I, it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't going to write a book and I wrote a book. <laughs> I've got a solo show. Yeah. That's strange, but, but also beautiful. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, and, Something that people frequently tell me is what a gift I am to other people and the work that I'm doing. And that's mm. what I was just, when I was watching the clips of your your show, I was thinking, oh, everybody needs to watch this, you know, because <laughs> oh, it, it kind you. of puts things in, in perspective in a way that we don't usually talk about. Right, right. It's so taboo, you know, grief uh, and sudden traumatic grief and child loss. These are all subjects that people don't want to talk about. But as a result, it, 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 it has all those bad taboo, you know, layers of, of <laughs> I don't know what, bad feelings. Um, scary. It's scarier than it. Than, um, I mean, of course, it is scary. But, um, but talking about it helps. Yeah. Yeah. It really yeah. does. And, and having somebody willing to have that conversation with you or willing to just listen to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you talked some about um, grief counseling too, and mm -hmm. getting what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, like talking to a therapist or mm -hmm. talking to grief groups? Yeah, well, either or both. Yeah, both. Yeah, both were very helpful to me. So, so Gail and I, my wife and I, we we joined two different compassionate friends groups because compassionate friends, for those of you who don't know and the, they're listening, is a nationwide organization supporting bereaved parents, grandparents, and siblings. And that was really useful uh, and helpful. And we also joined Our House, which is a Los Angeles-based group that, that uh, deals with very specific grief. grief. So they, they pair groups of people who've had similar losses together and you go on a journey together. And ours was for two years. Uh, these, so we had to be a parent of a child, of an adult child who had died within the last uh, six months or something was the idea. Uh, and they were all traumatic, traumatic deaths, sudden traumatic deaths. So we had a lot in common, and then we we went on that journey together for two whole years, and we now we remain very close friends uh, with all of them, uh, all the people in that group. And then I also had a therapist. I went to a therapist. He wasn't a grief therapist. He was just a you know a regular therapist, but uh, he helped me. He continues to help me. I still see him every week. And then we also, my wife and I together went. Our daughter Ruby had OCD and depression, and she had a therapist uh, who specialized in in OCD and obsessive compulsive behavior and uh, or disorder. And he helped us. We, we went as a couple to him in just an early grief, just for the first few months. Uh, and that was helpful. And I really think, you know, I think therapists are helpful because they're, they don't have, you know, uh, they don't have any agenda with you. They're just there to, to help uh, or sound like a friendship. And they also have hopefully, hopefully some wisdom, <laughs> I'm sure there are bad therapists out there. And so that, that's terrible if you get one of those, but in general talking, but again, just simply talking about our experiences to people just helps us process it because it's so, it can be so big and overwhelming and scary and confusing and lonely. And the act of talking about it, I believe, or writing about it, um, I believe allows us to literally understand it, process it. Yes. it It's, so easy to uh, shut yourself off when grieving mm -hmm. from, from everything. And right. the, the process of writing and talking makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I keep hearing, I keep encountering people who are, who are struggling in their grief and they, and they don't want to talk. They don't want to talk about the person they've lost. And I, I think it's, it's out of fear, fear of pain, fear of the pain that's going to come. And I really believe you can't avoid that pain. First off, that it's not, it's not going to drive you insane. It feels like it will, right? It feels like if you think about the loss, you'll lose your mind and you'll, and you'll be gone forever. But that's not actually true. Um, you don't lose your mind. 
Uh, you just feel an awful lot of pain and then, and then it subsides, you know, and it comes back again in waves, but not being afraid of that, of that pain, I think is so helpful because it allows us to talk about the one we've lost. Yeah, that's such an interesting point. I know a lot of people, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, counselors say that there are only two real emotions and that's love and fear. Oh. And as long as you're stuck in fear, you can't really experience the, the love. Mm. So if you can recognize mm-hmm. your fear, what is it you're afraid about, about your grieving? What What's causing that fear? If you can recognize it in a way that you can let it go. And I, I always recommend writing about it because you can let something mm-hmm. bounce around in your head forever and never deal with it. But if you yeah. write it, there's something about putting it in writing can can really help. And then if you realize, you know, in your situation, what do you have to fear? Mm-hmm. And and when you, you see that, then you can focus on the love. And when you focus on the love, I know for me, with all the work that I've been doing and and recognizing that and focusing on love in my life, what I say now is I'm actually happier now than I ever have been. Wow. Which is is kind of people go, really? <laughs> you know, you have two husbands <laughs> die. How come you're happy? Uh, and I, I'm not happy because they died. I'm happy yeah. because they lived and because we lived together and we had a beautiful life together. Yeah, and that's love. what I focus on. Yeah. 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 I, I, I completely agree. You know, I think being fixated on the moment of someone's death. Um, and the tragedy of it all is it's going to blind you to the love that you had, uh, mm-hmm. all the beautiful memories you had, you know. And if you're scared of to even think about that person, then you're closing yourself off from all the beautiful memories. You can't. How can you how can you remember the joyful moments if you're too scared to even say their names? Right. So so that the fear is blocking you from from accessing the happiness. That's right. Yeah. You, yeah. you can't have both of those things coexist. Yeah. You know, you, you have to decide which one you want to have mm-hmm. and focus that direction. And it will work. Mm-hmm. You just have to commit to it. Yeah. Well, this has been an absolutely lovely conversation with you. Uh-huh. I'm so yes, glad I got you. to talk to you. If if you, our listeners are anywhere near New York, go see his show. What a gift <laughs> that you have to, to get to see that. Yeah. And everybody can okay. read his book. Yeah, Here's there you book. go. It's, it it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful yeah. book. And mm-hmm. I, I highly recommend it. So Thank please read so that much. too. And we'll put <laughs> all that in the show notes so that you can see how to, how to get the book. And, and uh, I encourage you to do that. So oh. thank you, Colin. This has been thank wonderful you. being able to talk to you. Yeah, it's been a delight. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And to our listeners, we'll see you again next week. And can't wait to share more things for you to think about that's going to help you be happier in your life. Do you want more comfort, support, and happiness? Join the Grief and Happiness Alliance. Visit my website at lovingandlivingyourwaythroughgrief.com and read my book, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge on all our episodes on grief and happiness. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode.